live your life. Just over there, everybody, a little elephant that is seemingly stalking us. He's just hiding under the shade there. Now, while he's there, just enjoy him, and I'll tell you that you are on a live safari, so please do send us questions. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv on the email if you want to talk to us. It's a beautiful afternoon here in the northeast corner of sunny South Africa. Sunny for the moment. 24 degrees Celsius, apparently. That's roughly 71 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are probably about six or seven elephants around us. One of them's just walked past the back of us. So silently, you almost can't hear him. It's a young bull. I think these are the same chaps that we spent quite a lot of time with yesterday afternoon, Brian and I. On the other vehicle, the Duke of Sydney, Hayden Turner. He is currently trying to find the lions that were seen today. Astonishing sighting Jamie had of the lions fighting with each other. Just try and get a sense of the unbelievable piece of this. One or two starlings in the background. Otherwise all is silent. Very, very peaceful afternoon. Isn't that nice? Look at this little chap who's just probably, what, Brian, about 10 meters from us, 30 feet or so. Now, of course, you do know it is Olympics at the moment. The Olympics are on in Brazil. If you didn't know that, you've had your head buried in the sand for some time. Um, and we had our own Bush Olympics today. Of course, I will give you the results of the six events that were held today during the course of the afternoon. First uh, event that was held was the shot put or the elephant dung put as it was today I opened up the account with a what I thought was respectable throw I didn't end up on the podium at all Brian uh, you took the podium position there didn't you you, you took gold in the elephant shot put with an impressive throw of about 500 meters there is Brian's Olympic thumb to show his celebration of his exceptional performance in the elephant dung put. Well done, Brian. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. good job. I'm going to try and move a little bit forward and see if we can't get a slightly better view. This chap is very close to us, but he's right in the middle of a thicket. Yeah, they're talking to each other now. I think there's been an order given. No, no movement. Let's just sneak a little bit forward. There are quite a few elephants around here. Shame. All right. While we find another good viewing position for these elephants, let's go across to Hayden and find out how his lion search is progressing. Well, welcome, folks. Great to be with you again uh, this afternoon. My last uh, drive for this little visit, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Goodness me, I've had a good time. It's been amazing to work with the team again and be in this magnificent location. Uh, my name's Hayden Turner. If I've never met you before, lovely to meet you. If I have met you before, great to be back with you and welcome to Safari Live. If you've got any questions, please send them to us at either Twitter, uh, you can tweet them at hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. So I'm here with Jandre today uh, for my last drive, which is absolutely brilliant. And we just thought we'd come across uh, this morning. It was an absolute smorgasbord of activity. There was the calmness of the elephant herd and the breeding herd all around us this morning and all that action with Jamie and also, of course, the bushwalk. And we did that little uh, little cross to schools this morning in uh, New South, the state of New South Wales, Australia. We had just uh, under a 1,000 kids watching. It was just brilliant. And uh, we've got amazing feedback. They all had a brilliant time. So thank you very, very much to everyone that was involved. Um, so... We had a, we, it was elephantastic for us this morning, but being International Line Day yesterday and I didn't see one proper, I just thought, I just asked the guys, I said, would I be able to go and try and find some lions? Well, I don't know where they are. Can you see any, Jandre? Oh, there we go. There's one right there. Oh, actually, there's more than one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There's actually quite a lot. How fantastic is this? 
they are all resting they're all flat and you know what it's absolutely fine I'm so fine with seeing flat cats they are just magnificent and these boys this is a Birmingham boy I am not maybe you could help me if he does look up but I doubt he's going to look up if you can recognize which particular individual this is please tweet or email and let me know I just tell you a little story about these guys uh, the Birmingham boys when I first met them was up on they were, they were just coming into uh, Females just put his head up, her head up over there, but she's about to lie down as well, I think, at the back. She's just looking at us, and she's cool. She's, they're very relaxed, and they're very used to us, so completely undisturbed by us. Didn't even raise their heads, the females, when we, when we drove up. And uh, I first met these, five, when there was five boys, before uh, our scrapper uh, left the, the great savannah uh, and bush. Uh, there was five of them, and I met them on, I think it was in Parlour Plains or Sandy Patch. VM and I came around the corner one day, and there was these three young boys uh, who'd just come in to the area. And they weren't very vocal, but uh, they were definitely looking fantastic. And I had a few interactions or encounters with them, and beautiful sightings over that time. And then, you know, everyone here, or most people that are listening that are regulars, uh, uh, know the story and are really up to date with all the all the movements and all the different uh, encounters that these animals have had with uh, the Incahumas and other lions. But uh, it, it's just great to be back with them for me. I try and keep track with them as much as I possibly can uh, by reading, you know, the Facebook updates. And you know what the interesting thing is? You guys, when it's someone like me coming back for a short stint and I haven't been here, you guys are the experts when it comes to the social interactions and the history of them. So uh, I'm not going to try and go into the history. But for first-time viewers, if there is anyone watching, which I hope you are, uh, and welcome if you are, um, these boys have risen to uh, a successful sort of dominancy in this area. Things will change over time, but it, at the moment they're, they're, they're sort of fragmented. They, uh, they sort of come back in and out, and lion social activity is, is very complex, particularly when you've got a, a, a coalition of four males. So it's just really great to see them again. I've got a question from Debbie in Vancouver, and uh, Debbie, your question is, what is my take on what was happening with the lines this morning? Do you know what, Debbie, I've got to be completely honest with you, I have no idea, just because I wasn't watching, and uh, historically, uh, I'm not sure who, you've really got to know each individual, and uh, I'm not really sure what happened, or, or Jamie did tell me a little bit about, there was a bit of scuffling going on, and, and so on, but... I really can't uh, answer that honestly, Debbie, other than I think uh, now it's all settled down. I think it was potentially just one of the boys coming back and then a little discrepancy between the females and so on. I really can't uh, answer that with, with proper knowledge because also I didn't see it. But uh, the wonderful thing is that those cubs are all looking fantastic and the lioness are looking absolutely fantastic as well. They are really special, these animals. And being World Inter um, International Lion Day yesterday, it was really fitting uh, that we, we got lions and shown people how incredibly important these creatures are. As I always say, historically, just with, with this historically, economically, all these different things, but just on natural beauty as well. Sometimes we always have to put things in a in a place or in a pocket or in a pigeonhole why we need them and I suppose scientifically that's fair enough but you know what there's this there's this sort of area of watching wildlife that you can't really put into a box and it's it's why we all do what we do it's why you all watch it's why we come and drive around relentlessly to find to visualize these beautiful creatures I'm sorry to get them visual and it is just a beautiful thing to sit and be it does good things for you watching wildlife there's no doubt about it. Research has shown uh, with a lot of children uh, spending more time in the outdoors, they really do uh, improve their lifestyle in so many different ways. But without going into all the detail, it is a great thing for the soul and great thing for young people growing up. But wow, 
How beautiful are these guys? Speaking of growing up, those little cubs, I'm just going to have a look through my binoculars. I'm not sure how many there are. Oh, if anyone can send me a, a tweet and tell me how many there are, that'd be fantastic. I can see one, two, three, four, and five. Am I right in saying that? Send me a tweet and help me out there. I can see five cubs, or is it six? Five cubs. And the team have told me, but again, I um, numbers in your head and all different things going on and the school programs this morning and different things, concentrating on different things. Uh, as you get older, <laughs> you forget things. Yesterday, or this, yesterday I had a shocker. The, the, the final control, the directors and were reading out questions to me with people's names and I was just... I was just forgetting the person's name and the question by the end of the question. It's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, AJ. Uh, I still, uh, inside, I still feel like a little boy. But uh, sometimes you're just listening to different things. I'm driving around going, wow, I'm back in Africa. Oh, it's lovely. So these beautiful uh, creatures are going to be flat like this for some time. And I just wanted to get a, a visual on them so we could... Um, so we could come and just be here for ourselves, by ourselves for a little bit because there will be other vehicles arriving at some point when the, the uh, game drives go out from the different lodges. But he is a big boy now. So I think we're going to cross over to James and see what he's got and I think he's still with those beautiful creatures that we were with this morning. Gosh, can't get enough of them either. We'll be staying right here for a while and we'll see you just now. We are indeed still with the elephants everybody and we've had a wonderful time here. They've been sort of uh, standing next to us as a young bull here. His mother who's a little bit angry, I think it's his mother or maybe an aunt, has moved off now. She's just left. And they were sitting feeding quietly here at this mangled remains of a Combretum calinum or variable bush willow. And I said at the start there are probably about six to eight elephants around. I think they're probably closer to ten or fifteen. They're all sides of us and there's another lot coming now. Well, will come from the right. We're going to stay on this bull for now. And then when these other chaps come a bit closer we'll go and show you them. See him picking off the last little bits of this hapless tree, which astoundingly will not die, despite the attentions of these elephants. It does amaze me the skill with which they are able to do that. They're able to not sort of stand or kick the really hard bits of the tree there. He places that foot exactly where he wants it and snaps exactly the piece of bush that he wants. and now fiddling with the last little pieces of leaf and stick that he thinks might taste quite nice for his tea or his lunch I suppose not quite a tea time yet are we Brian? Late lunch. Yes, late lunch. Wonderful stuff. There he is just feeling there, watch his trunk I suppose you can't really see it behind the behind the legs but what's going on here is um, he's being very specific about which part of the plant he wants to eat and so he feels each one did you hear that that was him talking everyone he's talking to the female that's just moved off maybe she said to him come on let's carry on I don't really like the cut of their jib and he said no they're all right I'm just enjoying this bush I'm going to stay here a bit longer Now that sound they make, I'm sure most of you know, is made by the voice box. It's, although it sounds like a sort of low stomach rumble, it isn't. It's very much the voice box or the larynx that makes a noise, and it's because it's so very big, it's a massive larynx, that it's able to make that very, very deep, low frequency sound. And you might be able to hear the sort of chewing. Mm. 
He's not being very polite about his eating, is he, Brian? No. No. Oh, he looks like Steph or Herbert looking for scorpions. So the extras with the trunk and the feet. Of course, if you sit in here delicately or his being so close, you might think to yourself, well, he could stand on his own nose. But what actually happens is that that trunk takes probably about two years before it's able to just flop onto the ground. And that's because it takes so long to learn to use. And those little elephants that you see with the tiny little trunks, they're unable to touch the ground. And that is because we think, or I think, I'm not sure I've ever read this, I think I might have, but I think it's because they're, it's to avoid them standing on their trunks and doing sort of permanent damage. Because they just sort of wave and flop about on the front of a young elephant's face. Until they're about two years old. Oh, very nice. Did you hear that, Brian? Mm -hmm. A nice little uh, blowout of flatulence there, everybody. If you are purely a vegetarian out here, especially if you're eating such a massive amount of roughage with not much in the way of nutrition, then you're going to make a lot of gas. And there is another little herd of three, probably part of the same herd. And there we go. It's a cow. Now you can tell the difference. She's a young, youngish cow, but she's clearly got probably at least one or two offspring. She's pushing him off. Isn't that amazing? They're only about eight meters from us, 24 or five, 26 or seven feet. She's bigger than him though, so she'll push him off. And you can tell very nicely there that how, look how square her forehead is. You can tell immediately she's a female. His is not particularly round, this young bull's. But you can tell that she's a cow also from the fact that she is swollen um, on her chest. So elephants make the most sort of humani humanoid feature. But they've got what we call inguinal mammy. No, sorry, pectoral mammy. So same as human beings, they've got their mammary glands on the chest, which is unusual for a mammal. Much more common that they're inguinal or down on the stomach, same as dogs and cats and cows and goats and impala. She didn't like what he'd found. Beautiful. And still the only bird you can hear is that little single starling in the background going. Gosh, it is very soporific sitting here in the sun, I must say. Delicious temperature. I'm not quite sneezing, but certainly snorting up some of the dust that unquestionably goes into the trunk. I'm very glad I don't have to eat like that, where, you know, I to push my nose into the dirt and inhale strongly. I imagine I might sneeze a bit. Brian, you definitely sneeze. I'll be sneezing all day. Yes. <laughs> He's digging quite a hole here. If you look around, there are quite a few of them. Righty, we're going to sit here with these elephants a little bit longer. Let's, oh, sorry, my glasses were on. Let's go back across to Hayden and check out the lions. The sun is very bright. So, we just tried to get a better location, uh, but as we went round, we found that the bush was a little bit too thick around there, so we thought we'd stay where we are. Some of the females moved into the shade a little bit more. I was just saying to Jandre, sometimes I often, it often amazes me, lions will pick the, the slimmest little sort of sliver of shade, and uh, there's another big patch of shade right behind them, but they just can't get up and move. It's like... It's like being so tired when the mosquitoes in your tent, you just can't uh, get rid of it. But they do, uh, they're just so, so flat out. It's like, oh, I'd just rather deal with the hot night 
or the hot, sorry, the hot day, and uh, one of the females did move into better shade, and then there's a couple of cubs that are down there, and they've just followed her. So, look, we're just going to sit with them for a while and watch. There's a little interaction going down on there with the females. She's just laid back down now, but all the cubs are down there, and there is another male down a bit further. He's out of our vision at the moment, but he did sit up. So we know where they are, it's fantastic to be with them and I think it's just nice to sit and watch. There's a little bit of interaction happening with the youngsters which we're going to stick on for a little while. Uh, and we may get a female that comes up and greets um, this, this beautiful boy just here now. So let's see how we go. Um, and I'm just click, clicking away now and again folks because I just love pictures of lion and I love these guys I really love the Birmingham males and uh, just a pleasure to be in their presence gives you a really good indication of that thickness of that mane while we're looking at it that that mane is uh, really 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 come along since uh, I've seen them last. It really darkened up as well. So Tash Michelle has just asked us a question uh, about coalition males and is there a more dominant one? Look, um, Coalition partners are usually sort of related males, not always, but usually related males that have left a pride in their adolescence. So there is some form of bond uh, through them and they stay together as nomads until they mature and they get the power. I mean, the great thing about being a coalition is that if you're a single male line looking after a pride, you have stand very little chance of... Uh, uh, being successful in a fight or a dominancy uh, skirmish but up against the coalition of even two males. So there's this power in numbers, there's no doubt about that. He looks very comfortable there at the moment, doesn't he? Uh, and you know what, they, there's been lots and lots of studies done. Um, sometimes one of, the boy, one of the males will be more dominant than others within them before they even meet females. And then you'll get... Uh, a male that will go off with a female and and mate. Reproduction is uh, pretty much year round and uh, it's synchronized within the prides and that's a result of take these takeovers really uh, and you've probably heard of infanticide, Tash Michelle and everyone else listening where the males that do win over a pride and oust uh, another male they will uh, kill all the other offspring to make their gene the successful gene. So these takeovers sort of typically uh, three sort of four cubs per litter occur and they sort of synchronize it so that's why we've got I think the John Dre was telling me eight cubs but we're not sure uh, when exactly they were born. Well I'm not sure that's for sure many of you watching probably are. So within that time uh, if one male goes off with another female and uh, does mate they <laughs> you've probably heard there's an estimated sort of mating of over 3,000 uh, copulations uh, copulation times so it's it's pretty incredible uh, it is really really difficult to say you'll find that another once one's out of the way one of the other males will just step in and try and mate if the other one comes in another one comes into estrus so there will be potentially a more a stronger more dominant male but uh, they avoid conflict in this coalition most of the time we saw some things this morning and as Jamie said this morning it's a lot of bark you know with lions but, you know if they know each other there's a lot of noise and and carry on but uh, they settle down as you can see so we're going to sit with these guys and I'm just going to take a few more photos and whilst I do that we're going to cross over to Brent who is on Bushwalk and uh, that's fantastic to hear that he's out as well. So great to be here and we'll see you just now.
Welcome to a walking safari in the middle of the African bush. My name is Brent. I have the incredible VM on camera today and we're going to take you on an adventure on foot. So the nice thing about bushwalk is we get to look at some of the smaller things that we don't often see from the vehicles. But if we're really lucky and what I really love doing on foot, we might find some fresh lion or leopard tracks and we'll be able to try sneak up to them on foot. So very exciting to have you all here. Remember we are live in the middle of the African bush and you can ask me questions by using the email address questions at wildearth.tv or the hashtag safari live on Twitter. Let's keep going. So we've just set out across quarantine at the moment and we're making our way down towards Philemon's Dip. Now that's a little river system that runs through the center of a Juma and it's a really good spot not only to look for lions and leopards but to look for lots of little critters as well as there's some evergreen trees around there hopefully some insects as you can see it's incredibly dry around us we're in the middle of the worst drought since 1992 now often people perceive drought to be a bad thing but that is not the case it is just a different cycle in nature and it does some make it really great for certain animals like the big cats and the hyenas and it takes a little bit of a toll on the buffalo, the impala, the elephant. But every animal has to have its time in the sun. So we've gone through an incredibly wet last 10 years. So all the herbivores uh, and a lot of the plant species have been really dominating. And I can't believe I found the first wildflower after that tiny bit of rain. I didn't think I was going to see a wildflower for months. It is a very sickly looking little heliotrope. There we go. Maybe I should let it go. It doesn't shake so much. Um, it is a little heliotrope or a string of stars. It doesn't have, quite have a string on it. Now the reason it's called a heliotrope is because these little flowers will move through the day following the sun. And I really, the last thing I was expecting to find on Bushwalk today was a flower. You can see there's almost nothing. There's just sand at the moment. There ha we did get about 15 mils of rain a couple of weeks ago. And there's just a little bit, en enough moisture to have a little bit of flush and to have the first flower of the season. Hopefully we're going to see a few more once the rains kick in. I really do love wild flowers. Yeah, that was a shock to see a <laughs> flower at this time of the year. Now, James Dungan is wondering, why is an active termite mound darker than a, uh, than a non-active and luckily enough for us we've got one that looks quite active there and you can see quite dark and behind us we've got one that is very inactive and actually has got a tree on top of it a beautiful little thorny curry oh no sorry a spike thorn I beg your pardon now the reason for that James is that the termites keep constantly working on uh, the, the the different the, the ones that are still active but in some cases that's not the case so when you've got these large macromides termites like that um, they are building with different soil when we've got these termites which are probably a different species you just look at the shape of the mound they're bringing soil from deeper so they're using different soil to build so that's probably the reason sometimes it could be because an active one is constantly being uh, renovated when a deactive one is not okay so as I said we're going to keep heading down towards the little river system that runs through the center of Juma. A great place to look for lots of things. So hopefully we're going to find something fascinating. And now I've, I've got my flower eye on since I saw one. Mm, not quite, but they, they look like they're about to attempt to flower. They're not looking too healthy though. Uh, this, this little plant actually doesn't even have an English name. Um, and it is a very interesting little plant because it is the host species for the Acrea butterfly. So the little caterpillars will feed off this plant, which is highly noxious, and in so ingest a poison that is hydrogen cyanide, which it then transfers through to the adult after pupating, making the adult noxious. Now, this is that plant I know I've asked and shown you on drive and bush what many many times so this is the first quiz of the day who can tell me what the scientific name because it doesn't even have an English name is for the little plant here that is the poison host species for Acrea butterflies my favorite butterflies while we try to keep heading down towards the river system let's go back to Hayden and some flat cats well 
Well, as is the case with uh, lions at this time of the day, we have flat cats still, but that's absolutely fine. We expected it to be. Um, we've just got another vehicle arriving, Mike from uh, Cheetah Plains, and he's just, oh, actually, I think it's Mike, or oh, someone from Juma. Oh, it's Mike Grover. Right, excellent, excellent, good, good, good. Just wanted to make sure we uh, were bringing people in to see this, ve this beautiful sighting uh, and sharing this with... Uh, people because that's what it's all about it's about sharing this beautiful experience on a really really quiet and relaxed level and you can see how calm these uh, these lines are beautiful females I love the shape of a lion, female lion's head I just think it's like it's so beautifully beautifully designed really really fantastic Got a question from Cindy from Tennessee, uh, and Cindy's question is: Is there any line injuries? Um, Cindy, can you just stand by for me? I just have to answer someone on the Game Drive channel, and I do apologise. Yeah, copy, mate. Uh, the little ones are here. Um, do apologise, Cindy. Uh, Cindy, your question was: uh, Are there any? injuries that we know of from the incident this morning. I don't know, Cindy, in the sense that I can't see anything at the moment. Everyone, there's no one licking wounds or anything like that uh, at the moment. But, you know, there could have been a little scratch here and there, but that does happen from time to time. Uh, at the moment, everything looks very, very peaceful and very relaxed. The cubs are just having a little, a little sort of a, a play down there. Very beautiful cubs, huh? Gosh. But I'm so impressed. Uh, I always think that those lines, the females, the head, in particular, that sort of stand, they hold it up high. They sort of we don't know where these elephants are going. We don't know where they've come from. We just came round. The ears prick forward and they get that beautiful, beautiful shape. Just standing up, having a stretch. Here we go. And I'm sure we're going to just plonk back down somewhere. That muscularity as well. Goodness. What a beautiful creature. Little cubbies. Okay, so the four females there. So we were talking a little bit before about uh, the difference with the mane and you can see the females are maneless and the males have achieved that sort of become bulky, that, that's, that sort of um, that bulkiness, that large and showy beautiful mane has caused them to become so bulky and they, obviously it's a fantastic benefit to them when they're fighting or looking stronger and bigger towards other males but it's beca made them become very very conspicuous uh, hence the reason why you know people always used to say oh the females do all the work they do all the hunting the males are really lazy it's actually got a lot more to do with the, the the males being very very conspicuous when they hunt they're still fantastic hunters don't get me wrong uh, they will be in there but the males do a lot of the really hard big animal jobs with like buffalo and uh, giraffe and things like that if the females are potentially uh, struggling if there's not enough on a really really big animal and there is a male around it'll be that extra massive bulk that will um, pull the animal down. So we're looking at well over 200 kilograms. We just got a question from James Duncan and James is uh, saying what would be the equivalent predator in Australia. Well, we really only had uh, a 
an, an animal there. It wasn't a tiger, but it was called a Tasmanian tiger or a thylacine. And they were at one time our biggest mammalian predator. Uh, and unfortunately, they are now extinct in Australia. But that would have been our biggest. We do have a dingo, an animal, uh, a dog, a native dog. Uh, and if one goes back in time, it, people think that they may have been brought across. Uh, who knows? I'm not really, really that au fait with the, the history of uh, the dingo to the point of knowing its evolutionary um, or its historical uh, status where it was in Australia and how many how many years ago it came. But the point is that it, it was an interesting situation where Australia broke away and was just it's got these marsupials, this this collection of marsupials that are so so incredibly unique. A bit like Madagascar getting lemurs, uh, and very, very interesting with the dingo is probably our biggest similar uh, large predator. But I'd have to re-answer that for you because you heard me say mammalian. Um, our biggest predator in Australia is our saltwater croc. The saltwater crocodile is absolutely extraordinary and it is the most massive predator. I, I've seen some crocs... Uh, that are just, you don't, do not believe that they're real. They are so massive. And it is an incredible thing. We're looking at a, remember they are a living dinosaur, crocodiles. So that's probably my answer for that. Uh, our, ne our next one down from that is a, we've got a Tasmanian devil, which is an incredibly wonderful animal as well. But uh, like a little mini hyena in its qualities of what it can do with its, its strength of bite and its uh, incredible sound. They're more, more like a, the voraciousness of a honey badger. So thanks for your question and a bit hard to compare really but it is probably what I said the dingo and the saltwater croc and then we have that incredible creature called a Tasmanian devil which if you need more information you'll see some great pictures online for them or you can go onto the Taronga Zoo website we've got pictures of all of those. So what I'm going to do now is sit with them we've got a little bit of activity happening with the youngsters down there uh, at the moment and we're going to go across to Brent and see what he's got, something a little bit smaller, but just as beautiful. So we found my favourite bird, or of my, I've got lots of favourite birds, but this is my favourite of the Franklin species, and it's just scurried off, we're just going to hope it pops out again. I think, oh, there's another one, there's the female. There we go, out in the open, and they're quite shy and retiring as Franklin go. There it is. It's the Shelley's Franklin. Now, they are far more often seen, I mean, sorry, heard than seen, and they're a wonderful <whistles> call that I got taught when I was very young by my grandfather, and it says, to drink a beer, to drink a beer, to drink a beer. Right. With the drought, we're seeing quite a few of these more retiring species more often is less cover. Normally they're, they're in the woodlands, they're in the, in the little river systems, and oh, as VM spotted there, oh, there's a dwarf mongoose. As well. Hello, little mongoose. Now, you probably find the Franklin and mongoose quite like feeding in the same area. You can see the Shelley's Franklin's about to appear next to the dwarf mongoose and it's an extra set of eyes and ears to spot potential predators. A lot of the, the creatures that will feed off a dwarf mongoose will also feed off a Shelley's Franklin, such as African hawk eels, slender mongoose. There we go, there's the Shelley's coming out again. Oh, and the mongoose right next to him. Yeah, little guys. Quite often when you're driving in a vehicle, the Shelleys will hear the car coming and then scuttle off. So it makes them a little bit more difficult to see. But we've just been going very slowly, very quietly, and we managed to get that wonderful bird on camera. We have got them on the vehicle before, but I mean then 
20 feet from me and carrying on their business as normal. So we don't want to disturb them too much. So we're not going to move around too much. Let's see, there we go. So the Franklin will feed off quite a variety of different things. Grass seeds is a favorite, obviously not too many of those around. Any little bug or insect that they can scratch up. And if you listen, so you're probably not going to hear from this distance, but if you look very carefully, you'll notice the throat just dipping every now and then. So there's a little flock of them around, and just every now and then they just do a little contact call to check where the other members are. of them. There could be a few more. Andreen says she really loves the colouring of that Franklin. Me too, Andreen. I find them incredibly beautiful. Now for our serious birders out there, there is a bird you might occasionally confuse with the Shelley's Franklin, and that is the, the female of the Koki Franklin, but it's about half the size, but they do have a white throat and very beautiful coloration, similar to that. But we're not going to disturb them, so I'm just going to sneak off this way. So let them carry on. We'll walk around to get to where we're going. They look so peaceful at the moment. That's a nice thing on bush walk. Elephants. Can you have some elephants? And we saw a buffalo over there as well, so that's why we changed our route. Just heard that low rumble. Now that's really important on foot to be listening for those type of signs. And I think we're going to leave those eddies. I think it's the same herd James was with a bit earlier. And we're going to continue on our endeavours. of the year you've got to be a little bit extra careful while you're on foot it's because of the drought a lot of those big animals like buffalo and elephant are going to be feeling pressure so we're going to quietly move out of this area while we do that let's go see how commander bond's doing ding 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 Oh, sorry, everybody, aren't we live? Um, that was just a little song called uh, Under Pressure by the late, great David Bowie and the late, great Freddie Mercury, which is utterly irrelevant to our safari, but for the link that Brent gave across to us. Okay. We have left the elephants, everybody. We'd spent quite a lot of time with them, and now we are moving down a road called Ingwe Alley, which is uh, translated loosely, in fact not loosely at all, Leopard Alley, and we're hoping to find a... Leopard! A leopard, exactly. Any luck, we will find Karula here, uh, two babies playing in the golden sun setting. Or... nothing. At the moment, nothing. We're hopefully going to find some tracks of Karula. I don't know if anyone checked this morning. Uh, with the mayhem of the lions, I don't think anyone did. Oh, there's a kudu, Brian. It's running to great speed. It too finds itself under pressure, reaching down on me. Okay, we probably have to stop doing that now. There'll be complaints. There we go. Beautiful young kudu with a whole lot of other kudus. Now, there are a number of words out here, everybody, that if you say them, will make you feel good. Kudu is one of them. Zizifus being another. And Gymnosporia buxifolia, a personal favourite. It's one of the trees. Ultimate elegance these animals have. They really do. 
and very long tongues, of course. <laughs> she kind of ruined the effect there a bit, didn't she? <laughs> By licking her eye. <laughs> I imagine it'd be quite disconcerting seeing a, a model, male or female, and looking at looking upon them and saying, wow, that's a good-looking human being, and then seeing them lick their eyes. I imagine yeah, that would be yeah, probably fairly uh, unattractive. And we had a really, really good sighting the other day of some kudu on foot. And they just didn't react to us. And they're becoming more and more relaxed. And I don't know if that's got something to do with the drought and the fact that they, because they're under pressure, they're sort of reacting less and less to things that they're, you know, they're becoming slightly bolder. I think also the more silent you are around them, the less you move around the more they tend to realize you're not after them. We'll move a little bit forward. Oh no, she's coming out, is she? Look what she's eating there. She I think there used to be a bit of mud in there. I don't think there is now. The other thing you will definitely find, kudu and giraffe. We had an amazing sighting, Brian and I, of a giraffe eating a bone yesterday. But kudu, absolutely, most of the browsers seem to be taking to a little of what we call osteophagia, the eating of bones, in order to help them with the nutri nutritional deficiencies of the dry season. So quiet today. So few birds calling. Don't know why that is. You'd expect to hear one. Or... There, we had a kingfisher, not a kingfisher. What are those big other fish eating things called, Brian? Fish eagles, that's right. That's not a very good impression, Brian. Can you do a kingfisher? Try. Here we go, everybody. Very nice. Kingfisher in the Distance by Brian Joubert. Let's move on. Oh, we didn't hear that, Brian. We're going to have to do it again. There's some nyalas around the corner here. So those are the kudu, the largest members of the tragalaphid genus that we get here, the spiral horned antelopes. And here is the middle child. I think the world's most beautiful antelope or certainly the one most beautiful that we get here, some Nyala. Two young bulls and their sort of consorts, I guess. It looks like sort of a teenage gathering, doesn't it, Brian? Teenagers off to the movies, Brian. Certainly until they told their parents that's where they were going. They're probably going to a pub, though. Very naughty. Oh, and you can hear there the rather unattractive call of the lilac-breasted roller. And it's, it's that very foul call that has given rise to its Shangan name, Veve, because that's what it says. I actually see it. I'm just going to see if I can spot it. Oh, yes, I can see it. A constant struggle to find enough food now at this time of year. And probably picking up dry leaves, you know, I think that's what they're eating. Hmm. Anyway, they're behind the bushes. Let us continue on our merry way. And while we do that, Hayden has managed to cajole his vehicle into a position where you can now have a look at lion cubs. Well, we've got a little bit of action with our cubs down here playing around. We, are, we have to stay the distance we are, folks, because we would not dare to disturb them. They're having such a beautiful time and 
you know, we are happy to be here and also we have our beautiful big male in front of us. So we, we are where we are and it's just great to see them. They're becoming a little bit active as the la afternoon shadows lengthen. And uh, you could just get a bit of an indication as Jandre pulled back there to show you where that boy is. And then the females are just down in the, f in a little bit further on lying. They moved into some better shade. And I do want to correct, uh, excuse me, sorry. I've got a question from Mr. Tuvak. Do, do lions have cold noses like domestic cats? Um, I haven't had the opportunity of feeling a lion's nose, Mr. Tuvak, uh, but um, I am sure that uh, they have any, all of their, uh, their mucous membranes would be moist. Probably in really, really dry times they'd be dried up, but uh, I haven't had the opportunity, nor do I think I'm going to test it out. I'm sorry to say if that's okay. Uh, they definitely, definitely have a great sense of smell that's for sure um thank you very much for your question and great to have you on board i do apologize folks i made a bit of a, a blunder there and I, I told you about how many times they made it was completely incorrect i was just thinking about uh something else i don't know what came over me then but it's definitely not three thousand times it's about 2.2 times per hour over about four to five days so i do correct myself there uh when that mating session happens I just was in Namibia and saw a female uh, and male mating most of one day that we were there and every time we come back uh, they were still, you could pretty much time your clock to it, it was quite incredible. So I do stand, I do apologise about that little uh, bit of misinformation. Those little cubs are just so beautiful. So they only weigh roughly about two kilograms when they're born for the people that are working in metric, which is, a, again, not one of my f most wonderful skills conversions of me uh, pounds to metric, but I'm thinking about four and a half pounds. It just depends on the... Not all cubs are the same size. And all the statistics and the things that you read are all... You know, there's always exceptions to the rule, particularly with when we talked about the coalitions before. I mean, every coalition and every dynamic, uh, line dynamic in different areas has, has uh, lots and lots of different uh, ex contributing factors that may change what books say and what research say. And things are constantly being discovered. And I think that's wonderful about science and wildlife observation is that you'll always see exceptions to the rule. Just walking around now. These little guys are becoming more active. I'm just sitting here waiting to see if um, one of them ventured up to this uh, big daddy here. If he's got the courage to do it yet or whether he's too young. But uh, I think Jamie said or someone said this morning they uh, they were playing with the adults this morning. It's starting to become a little bit more active. Everything in any baby animal's world is experience and whether it be tussling with your brother or your sister and wrestling, honing your skills, getting stronger, practicing, uh, whether it's playing with a stick or wrestling with your brother or sister, and they're all learning skills for these little guys. They're pretty helpless when they're a kitten. Uh, they I'm not exactly sure how old these uh, these particular cubs are. Maybe one of you could tweet us, uh, let me know that, and help me out, uh, and tell me how 
old these particular cubs are because I know we've got really really good data on most of our big cats on uh, Safari Live so anyone that can send me a, a tweet uh, that would be fantastic or an email Question from Pamela, um, do big cats ever eat grass or vegetation to aid digestion? Look, I'm not sure if it's uh, to aid digestion, but I've definitely seen big cats uh, eating grass. Uh, definitely have uh, seen them do that, and it would pro one thinks that uh, that is why it's done. Most veterinarians uh, that I've talked to have told me that uh, that's the, the reason for it. Uh, and I tell you what, they, they really do do it. Not always, but I've seen them do it uh, when the grass is available. But I don't think they'd be... There's not a lot of grass around at the moment, that's for sure. But Pamela, I have, have seen it happen before, and I'm pretty sure most of the other uh, people on Safari Live would say the same. Uh, it's not common, but uh, they do do it. Thanks so much, Pamela, for being on board with us today. One of the things I always love is a sign when the adults are becoming uh, a bit more active. They start this yawning session, and once they start yawning, one yawns, they all yawn. It's like, well, it's not like us at all because they're, they're probably not catching it, but they're just, it's a sign or a signal that they are about to get active. And I'm not sure when the last time the females made a kill, but this boy looks in front of us at the moment. He looks, he looks pretty well fed. He's not super fat but he doesn't look uh, doesn't look lean so who knows what's going to happen tonight we heard these guys last night these these males uh, vocalizing all over the reserve but particularly I, I went to bed at about probably 10 I think and one was passing our house and he let out just this just a little one and I thought he was going to go for it I was running for my phone just to record it for you but uh, that's all he did <laughs> and carried on beautiful so the little cubs are just starting to venture off going to explore and hassle their mom maybe go and have a bit of a drink see what happens So while these little guys are just becoming a little bit more active, uh, we might cross back over to Brent and see what he's up to. We're not going to go anywhere for the minute. Uh, we might just sit here. It's I know they're flat, but I'm just watching the, the cubs get a bit active, so they may come up and have an interaction. We'll just stay put, and we'll cross over to Brent. We'll see you just now. Fingers crossed this bird doesn't disappear. But have them. You see that silver cluster leaf? You see the moon there beyond? There we go. It's a black headed oriole. An exquisite bird that we hear often, but sometimes a little bit hard to find. I think just, I think it's to the left of yeah? Of that, keep coming left, to the left of that big tree, and up a little bit. Just come out of it. Um, a bit higher, and that's there we go. So it's in right there, centre frame. See that? Is that? Uh, <laughs> this is the one funny thing about little birds. Sometimes it's come off, but he's a bit higher. There he is. There we go. Oh. Black-headed oriole. The exquisite bird. You hear them calling regularly, but not too often do they sit for us. And quite often they're really high in trees, and this guy's quite low to the ground, doing a bit of preening. I'm 
Okay, here we go. Vim's going to try some ninja skills to get a bit closer. Good clean, so it's very important for birds to have all their feathers in the correct position. And for a couple of reasons, it makes flying a lot easier. And also, when during that preening, they remove lots of little parasites. Uh, but I think we'll try to move around to see if we can get a better view from him on the other side. So we've managed to reach the little river system that we've been trying to reach. And you can see there's a bit more green around me. So there's some underground water here. So we're hoping for some little insects or something around one of these bushes. Okay, I think he's going, he's so far that Oriole isn't moving. Take one step. Okay, there we go, VM's going into ninja mode. Oh, he, and he flies away. Oh, anyway, good try there. Uh, that's one of the things that happens. So, let's head down into the little river system here. Hi, Mia. Now, Mia is one of our favorite viewers, and she's four years old. Mia would like to know, what is my favorite thing about the bushwalk? Well, I think, Mia, it gives you a chance to, to really use your senses. To, to listen, to smell, and of course for me, it's always tracking. I love tracking, and we are looking for leopard tracks or lion tracks. This is always a good area to look, that's why I'm talking quite quietly. And hopefully, we'll find some. But it's just looking at everything, man. It's being out here. Uh, you don't have the noise of the car, so you can hear so much more. And you're, you're focused on so many more different things. Okay. Now, this is always a favorite place of the, the buffalo bull, the dugger boy. They always approach these areas very carefully, and of course, we do have security detail with us, and that's Steph today. Now, as you can see, the reason I'm looking here, there's a, a, a very prominent game trail, and a lot of the cats like to walk down these game trails. So, just checking the tracks here carefully, Hoping to spot a leopard track. But alas, no luck so far. Uh, as you can see, we're going to dip down into the little river system. And see what we can find in the bottom. Hopefully it'll be lots of fun stuff. But while we do that, let's go see how James is doing. Ooh, look over that, everybody. It's a great thick tangle of bushes. In it is a common diker that has unfortunately disappeared. We had such a nice picture of him, and then he moved off, obviously. He's a bit camera shy. Let's go a little bit forward. We might be lucky, but also in the tree above us here. A great number. Was there a monkey, Brian, or was it just birds? There are lots of birds because, of course, this jackalberry tree is in full fruit now. So let's see if we can see the diker again. I suspect the diker has been here. You see any birds up there, Brian? No. Oh, yeah. I can see one. It isn't a bull bull. We just go up here, everyone. I want to see if we can't see that diker again because I suspect he's also been eating the fruit here. Let's not go over the top, shall we, Brian? No, he's disappeared into that thicket. Um, yeah, birding in thick trees is not easy. 
because of course they are thick. Let me get out and see if we can't get a, a ripe fruit for you to eat because I've got to tell you, a ripe jackalberry is a delicious thing. Now, Jean-André always says I have to walk around the front of the car because that way you can see me go. Um, this, in this case, will result in severe injury to my person. Now, monkeys, baboons, birds, um, worms of various descriptions will try and eat these fruits, which means that they're not always available to eat. And I can see a couple of skins here that have probably been dropped. I can see a couple of skins here. How's that, Brian? A couple of skins here, everybody. I'm not, I can't face away from you, at least towards you, otherwise the sound will cut. And I also think things like those dica will come through here and eat the fruits and then leave the skins here. At the moment, I cannot find... Oh, here we go. Yeah, there you see the trees and I like the fruits here. No sound. Unlike many of the fruits out here, they don't um, <laughs> they don't ripen on the ground. They ripen on the tree. But there's one of the skins. Oh wow, Brian! Just above us, there is a hoopoe. Beautiful sighting of a hoop, African hoopoe. Isn't that nice? It's making a very strange noise. They normally go boop boop, boop boop, boop boop boop. That one went. <laughs> anyway, there's a whole fruit, and you know they're ripe when they kind of lose this colour. They lose this green colour, and they go slightly brown. But there are no ripe ones here that I can see. Nor is there anything else here that I can see. So we'll continue. We've done a little turn past Treehouse Dam, where we didn't find anything, and now we're at Twin Dams, where there isn't more. But we're hoping to find some leopard tracks, like I said, as Brent is. Ah. Squenzii, that's called, Brian. It's quite a vicious plant. Okay. On we go. Jackalberry tree diospirus mespiloformes. In the meantime, let's head back to Hayden and his lions. Well, we've just repositioned because these little guys got a little bit active, so I thought, why not let's get a little different spot, a different angle for poor Jean Andre was in that spot for so long. Uh, I wanted to try and give him a couple of different angles and look what we've come down to find. There's a leg in the air. Yes, that's one of the Birmingham boys, but look just beyond that. Oh, he's put his foot in the way. <laughs> Do you believe it, Chandre? <laughs> he's gone and put his foot right in the way of the cubs that we came to see. You big brute. <laughs> he just rolled over. It's a really common... Uh, a common position for them to lie. We've got a question from Rever, age nine, and uh, Rever, you want to know what um, are the cubs afraid of their dad? Well, look, I think you know when they when they come. Into the into the group, and the, the females start to bring them along with the prize. They're in hiding for seven, eight, eight weeks or something. These cubs, I'm pretty sure. Jandre was just we were just talking about it beforehand, mate. Uh, are about two months old, May and June. There was about five in May, and then some in June. So they're only like three and two and three months. Uh, and now that they're travelling with the pride, um, they'd have a, a very very deep respect for the males. And then as they get a little bit bolder and a little bit more courage uh, revere, they'll definitely start to go up and play uh, with Dad. But it's probably not a great time to approach Dad right now whilst he's asleep. Uh, they might get a little bit of a, 
a little bit of a push around. So it's really, really interesting. They'll pick the time and they'll, they can actually pick the body language when Dad uh, wants to have a bit of a, a play. I'm sorry, I just bumped my microphone there. But uh, they'll have a great respect for for the, the big males, as they will for females. But uh, great question, mate, and so thankful you're watching. Uh, keep it up, buddy. If you want to follow this sort of stuff and you want to become uh, involved in wildlife at nine years of age, if you're starting now, absolutely sensational, mate. So great to have you on board, buddy. Got a question from Sarah in North Carolina, and Sarah, uh, would uh, if a female from another pride came along, would she kill the cubs? <coughs> there would be no chance. There, I mean, these these three mothers. Uh, I think there's three females. Uh, they would fiercely, absolutely fiercely. It would be more likely the females would potentially uh, kill her. Uh, it, 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 every, the dynamics are so incredible. Uh, it, it just—it's so hard to predict what would happen. But these cubs would be put into a spot where they would be protected, uh, and the mothers would protect them with their lives. So I doubt it very, very highly. It would be only if there was a, a youngster that was so sick or emaciated that he was left behind uh, that that would ever occur. But. Uh, it's it's something that I've never seen before, so I can't really say that it, it's very very hard to predict the future. But it's a great question because the dynamic is that uh, incredible. We just we see new things every day that we watch lions. But thank you so much for your question. And thanks for being on board with us this afternoon. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So they're going to be weaned off their mother's milk at between seven and ten months, uh, but they've got a long way to go yet. They're going to gain a lot of strength from uh, the mother after about sort of this time. They'll be she brings them. Sorry, we just got another vehicle uh, coming, and that's the noise that you can probably hear. So uh, it's just really, really great to watch them grow. And this little beautiful, beautiful cub right in front of us is somewhere between two and three months of age. So they'll stick with their mum until they're about anywhere up to about 15, 16 months. Uh, and that's a, an interesting thing as well, uh, and they'll be they'll be dependent on the pride uh, until that time. And again, it just depends completely on the dynamics. What happens if a, another coalition comes in, or so many different contributing factors? It's an incredibly complex. Uh, dynamic line prides and constantly moving, constantly changing, and that's what's so fascinating about it. That little cub is watching uh, the other other vehicle that's just pulled up. He's there completely relaxed. We were just up near that other male, and we uh, started the vehicle, and he didn't even didn't even move. He just laid there, and we just turned around and drove around the other side. So these animals are very very used to us. They're very comfortable. When we drove up to this location here uh, with this boy that's in shot, he just rolled over and laid in that position. So that's the wonderful thing about where we are right here in South Africa. These animals feel safe. They don't find us a threat. We understand how close we can go. We would never overstep the mark. And we watch from a respectful distance. And that's what we're doing right now, enjoying this beautiful time with these, these boys and girls and cubs.
So another really th interesting thing about the Cubs is um, the survival is highest when reproduction is synchronised because they will have communal suckling and uh, that does have huge benefits, absolutely massive benefits because if that's the case uh, you'll find if there's a synchronised litters or synchronised uh, birth rate and those cubs are all the same age you're not going to have older cubs hogging all the milk particularly with that uh, that communal suckling so it is a benefit and they've got the highest the highest sort of survival rate uh, when that when that comes right so what we're going to do now is stick around for a little bit longer and I will probably leave this sighting and give someone else an opportunity to come in here soon. So we're going to go over to Brentwood Bushwalk and we'll make a decision on what to do. We'll see you just now. So we've spotted the tallest animal in Africa, but he's also spotted us. Now that helps when you're tall, you're able to see things from far away. So I'm just going to show you where he is. Looks like a big male giraffe. Well, we are going to try to get closer to him, but since he spotted us from here, we're going to walk away from him and then disappear into a little river system and try to use it. Um, let me just have a look. To the left a little, I think. To the, looking at the shape of that tree. Go to the left a bit more. I think it is. There we go. So it's not the best view of a giraffe from here, and you can see him. He's munching away there. But right, we're going to try find a, a route where we can get a better view of that big male giraffe. Now, giraffe are quite an interesting and fun animal to walk on foot. So sometimes, if you sit down and they see you from far away, they actually walk up to come have a closer look at you, sort of peer down at you. Uh, but he's busy feeding. We don't want to chase him or disturb him, so we're going to try to find a nice way to get a bit closer to him. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the slightly thicker area on the edge of this little river system uh, to mask our approach. Although, I think he's probably going to spot us being that tall, but I'm just hoping we can get to a spot where we're far enough away that he feels comfortable uh, and we can have a good view of it. He's watching us quite carefully, but we're still quite far away. So, let's just get to the edge of the river system. He started eating again. Oh, you okay there, Vian? There we go. So you can see, one of those evolutionary advantages of having a long neck is to spot potential predators at a distance. So he's had a look at us, decided, well, we're not actually a threat. He's going to carry on eating. Now, the main evolutionary advantage of having such a long neck is not competition for food or spotting potential predators. It's competition for females. So that males with the longest neck are able to swing the hardest and inflict the most damage on their competitors and hopefully chase them off so they maintain mating rights. But we're going to keep moving along the edge of this little river system and while we do that I'm really hoping to find some fresh sign of leopard Let's go see how James is doing. Well, 
We were also hoping for fresh signs of leopards, of course, everybody, but we then passed somebody from Chitwa Plains. No, Chitwa Plains isn't, doesn't exist. From Chitwa Chitwa, and they said that Karula has been found safe and sound with her two babies on Little Gauri. So unfortunately, they are south of the reserve and we will not be able to go and see them. She will come back, don't worry, and she doesn't have a kill, which isn't so good for her, but it's good for us. That means she might come and look for one here. Right, we're heading towards Biffleshook Dam now, where I'm hoping there'll be some form of activity. That we will t tell shortly. And I'm just constantly amazed. It's kind of slightly strange vegetation at the moment, because if you look into the middle of it, well, it looks like there's not very much going on, but there is at the same time this little flush of green from the bit of rain that we've had and that's on the ground, not in the trees. Righty, let's see. Tracks of lions, old tracks of lions going towards Torchwood. So we can't follow them. What is that? Is that a Nyala? Brian? There, can you see it? He's through there, it is a Nyala. So just a brief shot of a Nyala bull, everyone. I don't think we're going to worry about it. It's so thick in there. Just about at the dam. I always arrive at this dam expecting really great things. Don't you, Brian? Every time. Every time. Let us hope that our, our great expectations are not met with disappointment. <laughs> Hello Katya, what a very good question. You say, how do we remember the names of the Latin or the Latin names of all the plants here? Um, Katya, it's for me, I think it's different for everybody. I mean, some people just you hear them, you know, there's extremely irritating people who hear something once and then they know it. For me, it's just repeating them again and again and again and again. And I remember that the last one I learned was Terrazygum zambesiacum. No, Terrazygum oblicum. There, yeah, that's the Terrazygum oblicum. And that is the sneeze wood. And the sneeze wood tree uh, it, it took me an afternoon. I kept saying it again and again on the walk. By the end of it, Scott and Steph wanted to kill me, but I knew Terozygum oblicum as the sneeze wood. And there's a fantastic sighting, everybody here. Uh, that is Michael Grover and his family, uh, the Grovers, and their small child on the ground. There are very clearly no predators in this immediate vicinity, otherwise, these people would not be risking themselves or their child. Okay, on we go. Enjoy. You haven't seen anything here, have you? Ah, oh, no. no. They haven't seen anything here. I think that's just a stick. It is. Huh? I thought it might be a male lion, but it isn't. Alrighty, on we go. We're going to head down into the valley of the Mluamati. See, we still don't really know where that other lioness with her tiny little cubs is. And so it's quite a nice idea to go through here and see what we can find there. Right, the cubs are back up and playing. Let's go and have a look at them. Well, we're still here with these little guys, and poor Jandre's just waited so patiently with me here for the little one of the cubs to move into a good spot for you to show, for us to show you. Sorry, and he just stopped about two centimeters. I cannot move any closer where I, from where I am, so we're just going to have to be patient for him to just to sit forward a little, a little uh, closer. Kula Ann, fantastic to have you here again. This is so great. Four years old. You are four years old and watching this. I am so happy about that. 
you've got a great question and your questions are great 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 because I tell you what there's probably a lot of other people that thought about this as well are the babies hungry well you know what to Loran you can't see it from here unfortunately because we've got a lot of of sticks and leaves in the way over there my friend but uh, the, there's females over there mamas and she's got babies over there and they're suckling they're drinking milk from their mama and isn't that fantastic so any time that they want something to eat they just go across and drink their mama's milk which is fantastic so I don't think they're hungry they've got full bellies they're playing they're having a great time and uh, we've also got a couple of other ones sleeping as well but what a beautiful question to Lorraine. I'm so happy that you're watching and great to have you on board the back of our safari vehicle with us today keep watching my buddy We're going to cross over to Brent because Brent has got one of my, my favourite, favourite animals right in his sight. So let's go and see what he's got there. So even with all our sneaking about, Mr Giraffe has kept his eye on us. And without disturbing him, I feel this is about the closest we can get. He tends to watch us every now and then, but not too perturbed, carrying on feeding. And of course, uh, current dry conditions, very important to keep feeding, keep ruminating, keep well fed. Uh, we're not going to try sneak any closer. As I said, a lot of the herbivores are under massive pressure with the drought. So the little we can, the little we can inconvenience, inconvenience them. Oh, getting stuck on my words there today is the better. But I am still, oh, well, just because we've just had a giraffe. We have some giraffe dung right here. Now, the reason I know it's giraffe dung, even though there are other animals that sometimes have very similar sized droppings, is the way it is lying. So it has fallen from great height and scattered, doom, like that. And that's one of the ways you can tell it's a giraffe dung. And quite old. This one's rock hard almost already. There we go. So there's giraffe dung. So always in a wide scattering pattern, not a tight ball like you would expect to find from other antelope. Okay. So walking around little river systems like this is, is, is oh, one of my happy places. And you can always see there's quite a lot of hyena tracks that have moved through here. And it always amazes me of how many places I you know will walk. Now we're going to go down, down deep into the drainage. Always a good place to look for signs of leopards. And ah, we've got some very interesting tracks. I'm going to get ask for him to come down, so it's going to be a bit easier for him because uh, otherwise it's going to be a bit difficult. Now, the Inkahumas killed a buffalo a while ago, just after that 15 mils of rain. And this is their tracks from when they were in the area. Now, it's almost solidified in here now. I mean, it's rock hard. Yeah, rock hard track. So, from when that rain was, you can see how going uphill, they've had to really dig in and grip onto the mud to get up the hill. There's actually quite a few different sets of tracks of them around here. You can see slipping and sliding. That's a lion track as it slipped down the hill. Really, really interesting. There's always lots to look at. Now, uh, I have heard that, unfortunately, the leopard whose tracks I was hoping to find in this area, Queen Karula, has been found to the south of us. But you never know. We could get Tingana or Mvula or Shaluva. There's always a possibility of it. Some elephants in the distance. 